Ready. Recording in progress. Well, thank you for those of you that are here. And I apologize if you're watching us on YouTube. I am my own producer today. So I'm still trying to figure out the technical logistics for part of this. But I am, we're using Zoom as the platform. The only reason I didn't just open up Zoom is my license is limited to 100 and will be great if we ever get there. Uh, but that way, if we push it out to YouTube, there was no limitation on the number of people that could watch. So we're learning as we go along. But in the meantime, um, uh, I want to welcome Dave. But before I do that, let me kind of set the stage for these podcasts moving forward. Um, we, it seems as though we kind of rushed to get this one going. And it wasn't really that in the end. It's that I, I knew where we were going. I'd been pushed to by my guides to do these podcasts for a couple months now. Just had to wait till all the conditions were right. And so, you know, here we are. We said the first part of August. Here we are. So moving forward, I think we'll spend Sundays doing Q&As primarily in the morning when you can ask questions from me. Thursdays, I like to continue to find somebody special and extraordinary that has other magnificent things to, to share with us, um, like Dave. And so it was a good way for me to kind of segue into that for today. Um, I hope that I see other people. I don't see anybody else. And so if there's anybody asking any questions, you know, I'll raise them. But in the meantime, I really want this to be an opportunity for people to get to know who I met shortly before Shasta, still getting to figure out all the things that we've had past lives doing together. But Dave, I want to hand it over to you. And if you'll tell some people a little bit more about you, then we got an opportunity to on Rob, because this is pretty much for you today. Uh, that way, people that had never heard of you before, that were fascinated by what they heard, we can kind of fill in the dots a little bit. So I'm going to hand it over to you, my friends. Good to see you. Good to see you too, man. Peace out. Hello. Hello. Nice to see the tribe and uh, feel the good vibes. Everything's been cool since uh, I got back from Shasta. We had a good hangout. And then you and I hooked up on uh, Rob Yox's podcast in New York, didn't we? Yes, that was, yeah, that was it went amazing. I didn't know what to expect. And you and I, we can't prepare for these things. I mean, it's not like we script any of this out. You're going to get whatever flows through us. So, you know, here we go. <laughs> right. Well, that's interesting. I've, uh, I've had uh, company this week. I had Rob Potter stay with me for a week. That was interesting and fun. Rob was a good guest. And uh, he's off to better and bigger things down south of here. He's got some work to do for a couple of weeks. And then he's heading back up to Shasta and, and but you know, good timing for him. Cause apparently it was like 105 up there. And uh, I'm glad I'm back down here in Southern California. Uh, good news from the astrophysics group that I hang out with. Uh, a couple more people have uh, quit working for uh, Elon Lust and uh, they no longer oh. work for him. And they're, they're moving forward with um, higher idealism about esoterics and metaphysics. And uh, some, of the, some of the young scientists that I hook up with are starting to collect pictures of uh, extraterrestrial craft on their phone. I call them interstellar conveyance. And uh, I typically don't use the term extraterrestrial. I like to say beyond earth sentient or best. And uh, beyond earth sentience are all over the place. I've had my experience and we, we talked a little bit about that on, on Rob Yox's show. I'm um, a contactee but I'm also a lot of other things and being a contactee was something that I wanted to explore starting in 2016 when I saw a sphere over my car, uh, my son pointed it out, we pulled over and it communicated with us with a few light flashes and it went straight up and disappeared. And that's where my journey with um, beyond earth sentience went. Can you, can you hear me? Okay there. I can't, pal. I was just shifting uh, my view of you and I on the screen. So the experience escalated to first contact, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever you want to call it. 
I always considered first contact when you're actually in physicality with them, but I guess a lot of folks say that that's just seeing them. Uh, so in January 7th, 2017, a very large ship came down and collected me. And um, there's this some year. information out there. No, uh, well, no, actually, yeah, not this year. I haven't been on anything this year. Um, last June was the last time I was on a craft, and that was very strange. That was what's called a gateway craft, and it's a ship that carries two portholes for transporting off. One's an ocular gateway, the other's a frequential one. And uh, that was before I went up to Pasadena to go see my friend Nathan and to meet Rob Potter for breakfast for the first time. And they took me up and we went way into deep space. I've got some fantastic photos of interstellar space and a big armadas of ships. I've shared some of those with you in private. And when we decide to post those, then that'll be a big event. Right now, you know me, Lowell. I, I don't really give two hoots if anyone believes me or not. Because what we've discovered and what I've discovered meeting with other people who have had direct contact with Beyond Earth sentience is they're not, we're not in a real big rush to go out there and wave our hands around like idiots going, oh, we, we've had contact and now I'm selling t-shirts and making a documentary. That's all bullshit, man. When you have a, a, a solemn, very sacred meeting with species not of this world, it's a real treat and they impart that information to you. So I'm not a, I'm not a, a beyond earth sentient prostitute or a pimp. I'm not going to be going, you know, this is the agenda. It's this group or that council or whatever. Every time they come and make contact with us, it's a very intimate and very special moment. And so I think that's up to the interpretation of the contactee. And I'm, I'm starting to get really tired of hearing contactee talking about what some agenda is. And really, I think we are going to put together some information uh, like a short documentary and I am writing a couple of books and books take a long time to write because you really want to make sure that all the information that comes out of your brain is in coordination with the way people harmonize to reality. The information that I have is no big secret. It's more like the stuff they gave me was to help access higher functions of our brains to tell people what happened to me without embellishment and to let them know that it's okay, that there will be more contact experiences, but that when you have contact with them, it's a very sacred and individual experience. And, you know, I can communicate with them psychically. They set me up that way, but I don't have a lot of questions. It's been almost six years now since my initial contact and my th subsequent three other visits where I was taken off the planet and they sort of gave me everything I wanted. They changed my brain. They changed my con my ability to conceive quantum mechanics and quantum mathematics. And um, it helped me get through uh, school, uh, my university studies. And I'm, I went back to school immediately after being contacted to get my um, uh, master's of science in astrophysics. And actually, can you see the picture behind me? I can. That's a, that's a model I'm building. And it's uh, made from borosilicate. And that this particular model is of a solar system about, I don't know, about 11,000 light years from Earth. And um, it's a system called polymetry, which is uh, building three-dimensional physical models of solar systems. And this big sphere right there represents the host star. And all of these rods coming off of the host star are made of uh, borosilicate glass. And so when I put a laser light onto the host star, it travels along all these light, light borosilicate rods and lights up all the spheres. Wow. It's very, yeah, it's hardcore stuff. And what it does is it allows me to um, begin the slow and arduous process of mapping the gravitational fields and the electromagnetic fields of stellar bodies far in advance of uh, leaving Earth. So, and I was, I touched on this with you and Rob about, you know, perhaps you'd want to go to Alpha Centauri to see what's out there. 
Well, I think that by the time we're able to initiate uh, building ships outside of the parameters of government control mechanisms, uh, secret and private space agencies like Elon's place or like Jeff Bezos or Virgin, there's other companies too that we don't know about. There's a couple of big ones in, in India. There's a couple of big ones in China and they don't advertise at all. They keep it crypto, but they use public funds for it. Um, when we're ready to start building our own ships, say, Lowell, that you knew 15 physicists and that you and I were going to be alive for another 75 years, we could easily build a flying saucer on our own. But what I'm doing is the mapping system. OK, that's my part of the picture. And so telemetry is uh, prescriptive telemetry and allows ships that travel very, very quickly to circumnavigate the rigors of deep stellar space. And so I actually have a working model. This first model cost us about $4,700. And in order to build about uh, 17 or 18 solar systems, I'm going to be dropping about $25,000. So and are for, you paying for that yourself so far? Oh, yeah. It's, you know, it's just one of the things that I need to do. But what I'm able to do now is get a, a really interesting understanding about Earth terrestrial physics and terrestrial quantum physics and how that can be transposed into deep stellar space. Everything that we know about physics now, whether it's, you know, the five kinematic equations or the equation for rotational and angular kinematics um, or, uh, you know, the, the laws of thermal dynamics or Maxwell's equation for electromagnetism. Now, that one, Maxwell's equation for electromagnetism, where Maxwell gave us the right-hand rule and told us about the, just finally described the tholus and the, and the toroid of a magnet, which direction magnetic fields flow in, that will more than likely stay the same. But I have a suspicion as a mathematician that we may run into very exotic forms of gravitation or ma electromagnetism that we know nothing about here because our physics is Terran physics. It's the physics of the Earth. The Newtonian theory of gravitation is based on Earth gravity. And that's, you know, and that's all I have to say. So this conversation, it upsets a lot of physicists and scientists because it's contrary to the dogma that they've been taught in universities for a long, long time. And the ones that I've convinced to pull their head out of their ass are all quitting these big institutions because we're going to start our own tech company and build our own flying saucer. And it's well, there's already be... so much evidence of other densities that look a science. You can't ignore that anymore. Just open your right. minds up a little bit for something else that you're trying to be shown. And maybe right. that comprehension will fall into place. Well, and it's interesting, too, because I think there's a lot of psychic acuity involved with contact, because not only do uh, Beyond Earth sentience embed us with information, which we can activate later. And they do that from different forms of manipulation with light and manipulation with frequencies from far above us. So they can start imprinting us with codes and imprinting us with ideas, which we later think are our own ideas. We have a Sartori <laughs> or an epiphany. Because, you know, these beautiful species, they don't want money. They don't want fame. They don't want any of that shit because they're not interested in terrestrial emotional value systems. No. But they do, for, for those of us that have asked long and hard enough, and you really do, Lowell, you have to ask long and hard, uh, then they really will unload everything. And that's where having that relationship with them saying, my mind is my sacred space, so you're only allowed in according to my wishes. And if you don't set some kind of rules and an, an agreement about engagement intellectually with them, they'll just flood your mind and you'll go bananas. I guarantee it. So they know what I'm interested in. And they also know that we're a pretty simple species and not a lot of us can handle enormous quantities of information. That's one of the reasons their minds are so large. When we see photographs of beyond earth sentences, you know, they always have these big heads. Well, those big heads contain a big brain and they're pretty far out. They know stuff that would just knock your socks off, but we're limited capacity species. So the best we can hope for is to have a cognition of one complete subject. So if you get really good in one area of physics, well, good for you. There's 11 branches of known <laughs> physics here on Earth. And if, if you could master one of them, it's a miracle. You know, if I had known yeah, how difficult... Yeah, but you can only physics, ever talk to people about that. <laughs> 
Well, in a way, I think there's, I've met a couple of people who, you know, are just regular folks like you and me that, that, you know, I didn't have a huge physics background until I met them and they downloaded it. And then I went to school to validate everything. But there's a lot of people that have different types of jobs, but have a visceral intuition. And I think, I think our visceral intuition is something that's a human gift that science also doesn't recognize. And when you step back from a, an amazing godlike experience, humans have the ability to assess the total sum of the experience. And we, we store the total sum of an experience as an emotional recollection that we can draw upon. And we can choose to, to remember things emotionally, or we can choose to remember things intellectually, or both, because both capacity regions of our mind, which hold emotional wealth and emotional depth, or the left hemisphere, which holds very deep logic centers, can hold vast amounts of information. So I wanted to know about quantum physics, but I most importantly wanted to know about the functions of traveling through deep space and what we can do to avoid the, the difficulties of falling into a, a quasar or being, you know, being hit with a gamma ray burst. And so we need to have a, a navigation system which, which allows the ship while it's traveling very quickly to bypass these issues. And as we come to experience newer forms of exotic material and exotic gases and exotic electromagnetism and gravitation, we'll have the luxury to work those formulas out while on the craft, while we're flying, because our ship will have a polarimetry system like the one behind me, which will guide us through the rigors of space. And so I'm, I'm really happy to tell you that there's some special people that have all walked away from mainstream science with, within the last two or three weeks. And three or four of those people are very dear friends of, with one of my initial contacts who just opened up a whole world for me. And she is 38 years old and she has two PhDs, one in uh, mechanical engineering from MIT. And then she also has a PhD in astrophysics from Caltech. One of the smartest people I've ever met. And for her to sit down with me for many hours to show me that kind of patience, because I originally, I didn't go through the traditional system of education the way most physicists have. And for her to spend hours with me after hearing my contact story to validate my mathematics and to turn and come back and say, David, you're really onto something that's very, very serious and, and most exotics. So it's so far out that some of my friends are willing to quit their job to come and work for you. So I we would actually. I sense that she was drawn to you because of your spiritual connection that um, I hate to use the word spiritual to, to turn off people that don't want to see it that way. Metaphysical, let's say metaphysical. I think that she sure. senses a whole nother level of science that she's yet to understand. And that's exactly what you get to share. Now I want to ask you one other question before you continue, because somewhere we know we get to manifest the things we want. Well, you wanted to understand astrophysics. When did all that start? When you weren't all that bright a math student to begin with, where right. did that all start? It came from, you know, on reflection, we realize things that happened. You know, we, we think when something amazing happens to us and we're experiencing it and we have those memories, we think, boy, that's it. But boy, let me tell you, even four or five years on after being taken away on my initial trip, I'm still learning things and realizing things. I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, my deck guide, after my friend Kim Jim brought me on board and he prepared me by downloading all of the, all of the things that I would need to know to meet others, how to behave, the protocols of meeting a a vast group of scientists from different parts of the galaxy and the protocol and the etiquette, you know, they, they observe etiquette just like we do, you know, you don't eat with your hands at the, at the family table. And uh, oftentimes I believe they always expected that of our species. So there are etiquettes to, to observe. 
And in observance of the etiquette that I learned to be associated with them, to not offend them because of my low position in the sort of the food chain, I, uh, I was very well behaved. But I didn't have a lot to offer as far as um, scientific knowledge. There was not like no one was going to come up to me. None of the beyond earth sentients were going to come up to me and so and say, you know, hey, what do you think about this rhombohedral star system that's putting off quantum delta radiation waves? They weren't going to come up to me and talk to me about anything. So <laughs> when I'm sitting with, I, I, I was given to Weimer, who's this very beautiful, tall, yellow deck guide. And he was my travel companion. And he put me in my special chair in front of the window of this craft. And he stood with me for the four hour trip to get to Broccoli. Well, I finally realized that when he was, you know, when he was downloading uh, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and a lot of the stuff that we already know here on earth about physics, he put his hand on my, on my face, just like Spock does when he's doing a Vulcan mind meld. And honestly, the information flowed out of his brain and just laminated in layers onto mine. And as soon as it got done stacking up, it went beep. And all of a sudden, I was able to start talking about everything that he knew. So I have a feeling Weimer was pretty unhappy. He got stuck with a hairless ape. And so he downloaded all the mathematics to me so that he'd have someone interesting <laughs> to talk to. Okay, and the, the next example of this is they showed me a lot of their technology. They exposed me to their architecture, their furniture, their clothing, their everyday things, their food. We talked about physiology. We talked about sexuality. Um, they showed me their anatomy and showed me how their bits work. It was just unabashed and absolutely open and absolutely above the table and absolutely wonderful. It was like being with super duper brilliant professors who also also happen to be your parents so they don't really you know the whole time I felt like a toddler though intellectually I felt about that big and so this the first experience of being um, allowed to see the things that they use on a daily basis they took me into this room on the ship that was full of amazing children's toys and their children play with toys, but their toys are really like STEM toys. And there was this one series of toys that was, that they all looked like different amoebas and they were all different colors and they were made out of this thick sort of floppy silicone material and they had lights inside of them. And when you put them together, they start making more noise. And then pretty soon you put them all together and you start seeing these three dimensional math computations with this really weird music. So I'm putting this stuff together. It turns out I'm sitting, I've been sitting in the children's rumpus room for two hours. <laughs> and I turn around and at the open doorway on this giant ship, Weimer's got his hands like this. And he's like, are you finished now? And so <laughs> but I guess they wanted to see if I was like retard monkey and I was going to take their toys and smash them up. Right. So, but I was very careful and all of their cho toys that they give to their two and three year olds benefited me. I'll tell you right off the bat, they benefited me. They were toys that after I got done playing with them, I had total cognition. I understood what they were teaching me. It helped me attenuate mathematics centers that were always there in my mind. And these are little children's toys that they make for their children. And so after that, he said, okay, would you like to see how we design our, um, uh, telemetry program for flying through space. And I said, oh, yes, I would. And so he took me over to this gigantic, there's a wall on the way over to the center controlling area. And it is all drawers. They're giant, like two or three foot deep drawers. They have handles on them. You open them up. They, look, they all look like they're made out of the same stuff, all like this white Corian material. And they glide effortlessly, but you know the damn thing weighs 500 pounds because like the drawer he pulled open for me was full of fabulous round crystals, uh, crystal stems, um, and, and then crystal uh, uh, pyramids. And they were all ground out and they had little places where these stems would fit into a, a optically polished socket. And uh, this is where they build these fabulous 
galactic models with and then they build the model and they put it on top of this machine called a palameter and a spectroscopy machine comes and it reads every every light photon that comes through this palameter model and then they're able to attribute a gravitational or electromagnetic signature to each of those photons to prescriptively analyze what they're flying into so they gave me not only did they gave me give me the models how to build them uh, how to make a parameter, but then they gave me the specs for the spectroscopy mechanism. They gave me all the engineering specs for producing the computer that turns the image into a Boolean Cartesian language with variables. And then they gave me all the specs on designing a computer that shows the three-dimensional model of the solar system that the ship is flying into. So I'm turning some of these aspects over to my friends who have left these space agencies, and we're building a parameter. And what by did they God, think about it when they saw it? Oh, that fucking blew their minds. And these are all people that are far, far brighter than I. And they're like, you're on our team. I don't know you're on mine. And so nobody has any of the answers. I have all of them. And I've got stacks of paperwork of formulas and diagrams and everything because I've spent the last five years in my de on my desk writing all this stuff out. And it just flowed right out of my brain. It's fantastic. And so we're not giving it to any governments. We're not giving it to any corporations. They can all go to hell because we've seen what corporations and governments have done. No, this shit's real. And we're all going to be building spaceships pretty soon. And they're all going to need a navigation program. And yo, that's me. So as far as propulsion, we have some people looking at uh, the real technology, the spinning mercury drive. And, you know, the, the, it's a mercury that's encapsulated into several glass spheres and it's spun and heat it up and then it produces a plasma wave and then you get anti-gravitation from it. We're looking at other electromagnetic drives. So we have propulsion experts, we have electromagnetism experts and we have shielding experts. And they also gave me a whole bunch of information about ship shielding and uh, uh, creating polyethylene cortical chambers that, are, that, that mimic mushrooms. So it's really just a fabulous, fabulous wealth of information. And so I'm sharing it out with all these really switched on PhDs. And it isn't really, it isn't uh, uh, some sort of miracle lull, it's just evolution. We're all finally walking away from the man and we're doing what Tim Leary said back in the 60s, is, is to turn on, tune in and, and uh, you know, tune in, turn on and drop out. And yeah, that's you what know, they're doing. I know it's nice to take a shot at the man. However, right. he was a byproduct. And yeah, things went right. sideways. And somebody's responsible for where we ended up. However, I know. What a, um, we're what a cycling sharing. out of that, aren't we? Totally. And it's funny, too, because, you know, I don't hate the U.S. government. And this is something I was talking to, I think, you and, and certainly uh, Rob Yox and, and recently with uh, Bob Potter about this, Robert Potter, is that, we know that the U.S. government does terrible things, all right, and that it's it's a runaway government. It's no longer a government by and for the people, all right, because I don't know any bus drivers or moms that are holding down two jobs that are single moms that are also getting their kids to school on time that are in Congress, but those are certainly the kind of people we need. We don't need any of these highbrow pieces of shit that all have a law degree that sit in their leather wingback chairs, smoke cigars, and decide how many McDonald's to build in, in Bora Bora. I mean, I'm just done with this fucking shit and part of my language. So I don't hate our government. You know what it is, though, is our government's in serious trouble. So I think what Americans need to do is, is help their government. Remember that there's a lot of good people that work for government agencies, too. They're doing it just for a paycheck, but they have kids to feed and they've been backed into a corner. And, yeah, maybe they do understand the ethics behind some of the bombs they build and the stuff that they build. And they're struggling emotionally with it. I guarantee it. And but the government compartmentalizes things so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So you could be some kid with a H, uh, HR, uh, HUD over your face, a VR, a HUD, and they could be telling you that you're testing a game. And there could be 15 of you in a, in a little room in Vermont doing that with the NSA or the CIA. And it could be a flight game and they're, they're pointing out and then the targets light up and they tell you to kill them. Well, what you don't know is that there's 15 drones that's connected to your HUD flying over Afghanistan, killing children and women and Taliban and the rest of them. All right. So you just don't know. 
And so they compartmentalize the behavior and the activity of the humans that work for them. That's how evil and duplicitous it's become. So we mustn't hate America. We mustn't hate our government. We should go and offer help because yeah, our government's in, love our in, in trouble. Yeah. yeah, they're in trouble. Our government's in trouble, spiritually bankrupt, maybe morally. Uh, but there's a lot of bad stuff going on and people need to stop complaining, pointing fingers and getting on podcasts going ah, blah, 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 when all they really need to do is write their congressman, tell them that they're being bad and then start grassroots campaigns to elect new people. Because if we start using the law, then the law will work for us. But if we're right. just going to get lazy and, and get stoned and watch 15 shows YouTube about conspiracy theories, then you're not getting anything done. You're That's part what of the you're going to get back. Yeah, right. We know exactly. you get what you you're going to manifest what you put out there, and so I, there are lots of people that I've met in this community, and all of them still have an axe to grind. They're pissed off for really good reasons, and I see their perspective, but they all know what energy they put out is what they're perpetuating into the collective and. Somehow we're going to have to help people understand that, but that's a layer by layer process again to understand. First of all, we're energetic beings. Okay, when I can understand that, then we can talk about how your energy affects other energy and what it draws back, and then we can talk about the three dimensional experiment parts of this thing we're in. But um, I take great comfort in knowing what's next. Um, and I, I listen to all the things that we're starting to see from others, what's been shared with me, what's been shared with you. And I wonder, once the shift takes place, you know, are we in a place where those are no longer necessary? And I know the answer to that. No, it's not. These are more evidences of evolution. The um, system that you've been gifted to help humanity with is one of those things that I can, it, it's reasonable to me to understand the reason why we have it, but I've got to get to the place with everybody else that they understand that being in a spacecraft is damn likely. If your vibration matches, that's a whole another you know, kettle of fish and another discussion to have one day and it's meaningful, but holy cow. If we can get people to get out of their out of the screen long enough to at least pay attention to the UFOs that we've been heard about for decades now, and now it seems to be pretty common knowledge that yeah we know they're here and even the government says so. Oh, well, it wasn't that we need validation from them because we know how we right. feel about that. But the fact right. of the matter is they are there. So let your mind start to wander in those directions instead of the directions that you've been suggested and kind of conditioned and thinking about when we finally have first contact. It's not going to be a fearful thing at all. Uh -oh. My goodness. Right. We you created that scenario for ourselves. So I want to get back to listening to you some more. Well, um, I was just going to say you're absolutely correct, Lowell. And it seems like it's never enough, or it seems like it's never fast enough. It's almost like we've got to get the hearts of men to change immediately because all war is bad. All bombs are bad. All nuclear stuff is bad. Or I'm sorry. I know there's a, there's going to be a million Americans or 10 million Americans that are brainwashed into thinking, but it's our economy. And that means it's good. And we have a great country. And well, I'll tell you, America is still the greatest country in the world. And we are a wonderful, wonderful people. And there's nothing we can't do when we pull together. And right. I think I think that the thing that we need to think about is replacing the warmonger government and the government of idolatry and insolence. And right now we've we've set up a, a system now where we tolerate people who are barely able to cognate English and we elect them as president. And it's very, very sad. But then if you look at the motor pool. And you see what was available for president. Well, I guess he was the best option and he got moved in. You know, I, I, Trump is Trump and Biden is Biden and this isn't a political show. But what Correct. it is, is 
both of them are symptomatic of a larger picture of the ailment of this this great country of ours. And they're really just sort of physical manifestations of those symptoms. So what we need what we need to do is we can't force people to to stop having fear. And I think when when people are raised within the system that's really wrecking everything, that system, that loop of cognitive studies where you have to go to a specific type of schooling and you must believe in the banking system and you must believe in the housing system. And if you're not you know, paying taxes for 35 years, paying for a mortgage for 30 years and sending two kids to college, well, well, well what are you doing? And that's and they talk to you like you're an idiot. So that's the way the system was set up. And everyone went along with it right after World War II. We had that great boom in the economy in the 50s and 60s. And because of the luxury that we had in the 50s, we were able to start creating LSD and smoking pot and dropping out of the system. Those were results of the this, this system itself sort of imploding back then. Well, it's been imploding ever since, and they keep trying to prop the system up. I guess my advice to everybody is to remember that God is real, the divine creator is real, and all you need to do is find love deep in your heart to communicate with the divine creator. And if you want to talk to Jesus, that's wonderful. Jesus represents love. He is a, 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 a spirit who loves every soul on this planet and forgives us unconditionally. If you want to communicate with Allah or Buddha or, or Krishna, then please, by all means, do. And just make sure that you tell them how much you love life and how much you love other humans. And don't forget about all the little furry, fur, furry and feathered friends. Uh, the animals on this por- planet are just as important as we are then we have to defend them and we have to come up with civil rights for them as well, because I'm telling you, corporations are are steamrolling this country and using up our natural resources as quickly as we can until we get them kicked out. And remember, it's 20,000 people that control 7.5 billion. So you, what's wrong with those numbers? So really guys, turn off your fucking television set Put down your beer and your bag of Cheetos and get off your ass and start, you know, making a better future for your grandchildren and for your children. And that's what I'm doing is I'm not so much talking about the bells and the whistles anymore, Lowell. I'm really starting to just work on the message. Um, I am going to put together a a documentary with Rob Yox, and it'll probably be out in a year or two. Um, And that's going to be it. I'm not going to talk about ships anymore after that. I had a wonderful experience and I was blessed by God so deeply to have a loving, meaningful experience with creatures that just wanted to tell us, gee, Dave, when we return you to earth, please tell everybody, you know, how much we love you and that we've been working with you and watching you for millennia and we want you to succeed. And they really do. They want us to succeed, but it really has to come from us. We really have to get off our asses and get to work no matter what the sacrifice is. And there's a lot of scary things that are holding us back and we can't live in fear. We must shed those clothes because fear justifies non-activity. When you're afraid of something, it justifies you not being active towards working for a better world. And I'm telling you, my friend, a better world is a world full of common senses where children don't have to live out of dumpsters and little old ladies and little old men don't have to sleep in alleys packing their shoes and their clothes with newspapers because they lost their mortgage and they lost their inheritance, their SSI and their VA. I mean, really. And then the other thing is, I, I would like everybody that watches your show to spend one minute today to say a prayer for abundance and safety for all the armed services personnel in this country, retired, dead, living, or fighting, or otherwise, because this government is atrocious in the way it takes care of its armed services personnel. Did you know that right now that over 50% of all veterans, and that's including active duty government issue, have less than $500 in their personal savings? It wouldn't surprise Those people me. Do, those people who would be ordered out to save the life on the line for one of the government's programs who would salute and say, I think I'm being a good American, and they go out and do it. And those people come back and they have nothing. And that's it's the been first a, It's been a long that's the first time. first greatest tragedy. Sorry, go ahead. 
since we put elected officials in place, that regardless of party affiliation, once they were in place, they understood that they represented us all, including the people that didn't vote for them. So we right. don't have a system like that anymore. They, no. whoever is in charge, could care less about solving problems. And so right. here and we find our class, and all they're doing is pointing across the aisle at one another to blame somebody. Well, I don't care. We sent you there to be solution oriented. This is right. not what we're getting. It's just a drama house. So right. something's changing. Something's going to snap there too. Um, but that's going to have to be wholesale change. I am a fan of term limits. And I also think that there should be a system of mentoring. So that when you're in and you serve your term limits, that there's a whole bevy of people behind you that have all worked together in the same way that we got. So when it takes, when it's time for leadership to change, really the concept doesn't change. It's that it's time for the leader to move on to the next thing. And for the next person to step up, that's a much more effective system. But we don't deploy any of that because we're too interested in hanging on to power. Right. And it's, it's very sad, but we're, we're still very, very close to our earliest behavioral, emotional and chemical value systems. The, the idea of self, the id, uh, or the I, me, I, your ego, these things were developmental issues with us 12,000 years ago when we went from hunter-gatherer to accomplished agrarian societies. We still had systems in place regarding greed, personal adornment, uh, personal wealth, and how we value ourselves by attaining a higher materialistic value around us in the form of possessions. And we have to pray for the emotional trigger to cease. It's the genetic leap that we need to make is the one that we all at the same time across the whole world recognize that money doesn't exist. And then we have to think of our neighbors first. And I, I like what Rob Potter said in one of his uh, long talks about people that have the money to go out and buy a F-class series Ferrari. And, you know, they're wondering if they should spend $440,000 on the yellow one or on the red one. And when you're in a place where you're making that kind of acute decision, Gee, well, how about buying yourself a nice $75,000 pickup truck and then giving the rest of the money to orphanages that, that take children off the street, right? And what does that say about those people, the ones that we apparently honor? I think the media honors them. I, don't, I can't believe that we've got millions of little girls and boys in this country that idolize people that act like filth because really that's what they are. They're filth. The kind of people that have discretionary funds who wouldn't look to take care of their neighbor first. That's really sad. And these are connections to our ancient evolutionary past that we have to overcome in order to understand that everybody should be at the same level. If everybody had the same amount of money and everybody was fed, there wouldn't be half the crime, half the wars, any of that stuff, because we would all be satisfied. And it's at that point in society when we're able to move forward, much like the theology behind Star Trek, where we no longer find you know, the need for material wealth to guide us, but that research and science becomes our greatest goal. And yeah, but we've boy, been stuck here for way too long, just thinking right. that we need to be accumulators of things. Right. And if you're like a third generation kid that had to help get rid of his grandma's basement stuff when that was all done. Now you understand that the accumulation of things isn't all that. Why do we need four sets of dishes that have been handed down? And I appreciate sentimentality. Don't mistake that. But sure. there just becomes a practical side of things. It doesn't I don't see balance. And in that, then there's no justice. And right. that's what bothers me most. Right. And I think that, you know, the system that's in place that realizes that we're like pack rats or crows, right? Because humans like sparkly, shiny things, just like pack rats. And they like sparkly, shiny things, just like crows. 
And uh, when we get nervous in intellectual circles, we start talking about sparkly, shiny things because we're, you know, that's the way we are. Now, if we remove this system that puts chemicals in our food that causes us to need other kind of pharmaceuticals, which change us chromologically or change our thinking patterns so that we can no longer put up an argument for our own self-defense for civil rights or planetary rights or animal rights, then, uh, you know, we have to stop that system where we are contributing to it. The phenols, and the biphenols and the byproducts of plastics and the chem the chemical pheromones that come from a bottle of plastic water, they're turning, you know, the they're the they're shrinking the male testicle. And then look at the cro the the chromides, the bromides, and all of those things that are being poured into our nation's streams and rivers by um, metallurgy and silicon manufacturing companies. So they're permanently destroying frogs. They're permanently destroying amoebas, paramecia, euglena, all of those natural freshwater systems that would help evolution recapture its former glory should the fall of mankind occur. Not only are we heading down a fractal well of trouble because of food chemicals and abilify and, uh, you know, salts that we take to regulate our emotions, you know, boy, I'm telling you, you, you you don't need a pill for what ails you. If you've done something that you feel ashamed about, or if you're depressed, it's more than likely that something's happened that you haven't faced up yet. You need to square that away. And yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, this isn't a panacea to just feel better because I know depression sucks. My aunt Wendy had it and my mom Penny had it. And a lot of people get depressed. But remember that depression is a chemical reaction based on thought about ourselves. It's directly linked to how we interact with the universe around us. It's because, we're, it's because people don't think they're good enough. If everybody felt the way I did, they'd never be depressed. I think that I'm a loving, wonderful person who would bend over backwards to give you my shirt because I think all human beings are worth it. I think we okay. should all wake up together and all take care of each other. That's when we sing Goombaya. Right. But until then, yeah. you know, we really need to look at what we're eating, look at what the corporations are getting away with. We need to be, you know, what happened to the eco warriors? We need to get people protecting old growth redwoods. We need to stop buying shit from countries that mass produce everything in plastic and then dump the end result into the middle of the ocean. You know, that plastic patch that's the size of Texas that's floating off the coast of Hawaii. You know where that came from? Well, Clinton signed a, bit, a deal called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And at the same time, we did a deal with China to recycle all of our car batteries and all of our plastics. And so China went, yeah, sure, no problem. And so they get them just into the China Sea and then they dump all the barges of plastic into the ocean and then they turn around and send it back to New York for more and then they get paid for recycling. And it's been going on for 50 or 20 years. All right. Uh, so what do you think they're doing with all those Prius batteries? Right. All these people that think all of a sudden they're an environmentalist because they have a fucking electric car. Well, when those batteries degrade, they get shipped over to China. I can tell you right now, the Chinese government dumped over 10 million car batteries in the center of the South China Sea to a point where there is a stack of car batteries as tall as the Empire fucking State Building. All right. So it's this duplicitous greed. And as long as you got your fucking Sunday night football, well, what the hell? I don't give a shit. I could be dead in 20 years. And I'm going to heaven. Oh, oh, oh man. So we gotta we gotta break that paradigm. We really do. I mean, we really got people to say, I am the person that's responsible for this planet, not them, you know. I am responsible for the love of nature and the love of my neighbors. I am. And take responsibility for yourself. So it's a learning process. Not all people are bad. And yes, people have been duped. And so for those of you that have been duped into like going along like this, by the nose for the system, if you've been duped into being a sheeple, well, now's your chance to wake up. You just heard it from Dave Wallace. I just told you, pull your head out of your ass and stop being a consumer and start being somebody who's solving the problem. That's all. It's just <laughs> common sense. They don't know any better. It's the way we were all conditioned. And until something triggered inside both you and I, 
we were right. going along in the same path. So I had well, I had a, that... I had a hippie I had a hippie mom who was an animal activist and an artist. My story is a little different. I mean, I've been anti plastic since I was about eleven. But you're absolutely correct. All of us are born into a matrix like system that convinces you from day one that this is the way we live, and it's really sad. So I'm not blaming humanity. I love humanity. I'm I'm blaming the evil scumbags that allow the corporations to do what they do. If I had the chance, Lowell, I'd have every congressional person and senatorial person's personal banking and checking accounts investigated to see what special monies they're getting for turning the other cheek. I'm sorry, well, Citizens folks. United just to open the gates, floodgates for that sure. corruption let's, to let's, see let's replace itself. Yeah, let's replace all those bums with housewives, office assistants, bus drivers, whoever it takes to get yeah. normal, normal people. You don't need a, to make a, law, a law degree. No. You know, how dare they set that whole system up that everyone has to have a law degree to understand how the United States works. That's a law degree to cover your ass. Well, there are others that are getting into Congress without that, but that's just happening now. People just assume right. that a lawyer would be a good representative in a congressional setting. And we've learned our lessons from that. Right. But the system is screwed to begin with because it's not like either party gives us a variety of choices. Why can't there be four Republican and four Democratic candidates for president? Why? Why? Wonderful. Why does it only have to be the one that your party decided was best for all of us? And now you've divided people into, I got to be one or the other. And right. that's the degrees of extremes have gotten too extreme. So I'm looking forward to the reset so that we can get back to um, what's more reasonable and loving and compassion and unifying than the current situation is. I am. I mean, I'm sorry about the language. I know every once in a while I talk like a sailor. I just get so upset with all of us, you know? And so, yeah, I have to tell you, I don't waste my time anymore. One thing that contact with the honor of did for me was it got my ass busy. I make phone calls. I show up at rallies. I spend extra money on charities that I know are doing the right thing. And you bet. And that's what's valid. And I'm doing my share. So if anybody wants to come up and test me, well, be careful. <laughs> I got the bank statement to show where my money goes. And I am a pretty <laughs> smart guy. So you, you don't want to tussle with me on television. I'll make you cry. I don't think you, uh, nobody's going to be ready for this, but you touched on something earlier today. And I want to kind of elaborate on that a little bit more when you talked about, it's not about the, these miracle things that have happened because you and I talked about this a little bit last week in preparation for where right. these are going to go moving forward. And yes, my experience in TELUS was magnificent. Yours going off planet uh, on more than one occasion. That's, incredible information but they're not oh, it was amazing they're not going to be replicated by anybody else we're all on our own journeys but that doesn't mean that there aren't miraculous things in everybody else's future i can tell you that with great certainty when your vibration changes you will have your own stories to tell so now it's more i agree with you a hundred percent that it's not i will tell you about tell us and how wonderful it is this is about an awareness of multidimensional experiences and beings around us that are waiting for us to help in order to prepare us for the change that's coming in Earth. Right. And God, you know, so I'm so happy you brought that up. I'm so happy you brought that up because your experience was pretty mind blowing and it was full of love. And my experience was full of love, too. And I think underlying everything, even though we get angry or we become upset about stuff, the underlying theme in everything I do is always backed by love. Because if you get angry at a child, it's because you love them. If you get angry at your government, well, I have to tell you, I love my government. I know it's in trouble. 
So if we get angry at each other, I know that I would always love you. We'd just have to get over it and then move along because anger has to pass through us. It's emotions that don't serve us. But when you talk about understanding the dimension in which we exist and working with that dimension, there you've really grounded us, Lowell. Yes, you really I think our, that's the game on the forward, ground. is to help you understand that sensation that we're so close to that now. It's around us for those of us that vibrate that way. So somehow, yeah. whatever message we can help get out there, because that's my job now, is to help the rest of you understand the things that I've seen that, that I can do, and then I'm not the only one. That's the drum to beat. When you were contacted and when you were taken inside the mountain, what was the first impression that embedded you deeply about the Loving. beginning of? You said it many times here now, and that's the foundation of the Dex civilization I've seen and the interactions I had. I wasn't fearful that day when the mountain opened up and I heard somebody's voice and turned around to see somebody there. It wasn't fearful at all. It was more excitement and exploration. That's how, that's always been my perception. Um, you know, one day we'll have some serious discussions about what Ethereum is and what that's like and what you know, the benefits of ingesting that are. But those are magic things that were placed in my path as well. And what comes out of that is a whole another realm of understanding that it's another result of a dimensional overlap. That's how this stuff got here in the first place. Are you able to reach out to the beings inside the mountain, the Talos people, and communicate yeah. with them when you have that deep need? Yeah, I, I got to be honest, and maybe this is a good time to address that. You know, from the time that I had been inside until really this year when we were in Shasta, uh, that was when another kind of validation of the stuff I've been going through, because when there's lulls, even I go, did that really happen? Or did it really sink in? Well, then there's another validation that comes along. And the story about the Australian filmmaker and the Indian channeler who uttered my name in a Lemurian channel. Oh, that How was amazing. How does that happen? How does that That was that amazing. Happen? Right. Yeah. So well, you got to pay attention to the signs that are being sent to you because I've been getting all kinds of unsolicited messages. It wasn't that I signed up to sit down with Cindy, who can speak to me in a variety of star languages. I didn't do that. Cindy was compelled to reach out to me because she had messages for me. And the wow. messages were not just messages and content. It was to help me relearn those star languages. After I listened to that three times, because I went back to listen to it again, I could understand each one. And I can tell you this, that none of them are the same. They're all different star languages. They were different messages she was getting from different influences. But I understand it. Now, how does that happen? In the same way that those artifacts that I've seen along the way, there were little codes and little symbols that were placed on there. So I made it my business to photograph those, ask permission to do that. So later on, I'd be able to go back and look and see what the hell does all that mean? Well, over the last couple of weeks, I had a chance to do that. And I'm beginning to find symbols that are on more than one of these things. And they didn't come from the same place. Um, there was an end game to this rabbit hole I was going down and I'll come back to whatever it is. <laughs> well, I, I think that one of the, one of the things I was going to ask that's still in line was there are a lot of people who are interested in understanding languages, linguistics, ancient languages, future languages, um, but not just languages, but hidden meanings, uh, syntax, anamonopoeia, synonyms, antonyms, things like that. And there, there, there are a lot of star languages out there. And one of the synchronicities that I had 
was um, in 2017, I was taken away and I was gone for four hours on earth, but it translated to four days with them. And when I got back, my head was flooded with new things, technology and diagrams. And it wasn't just diagrams. It was very detailed diagrams with mathematic formula written down next to them. One of them was a form of Al Kubir's warp drive diagram. And in 2019, two years later, a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, Dave, um, uh, David Wilcock uh, from Ancient Aliens has called me up and wants me to do security for him at Contact in the Desert in 2019. And I need a big, strong guy like you to come and, and back me up on this. And I said, okay, well, how dangerous is it going to be? And he goes, well, you know, it's just cool people, but he likes to have security because he does get a rush of like a hundred people running after him and he gets <laughs> knocked down or whatever. It's, and, and to be honest, it, it's not very pleasant when, you know, David's not, he, he's a nice enough fellow, let me tell you, but he's not the biggest guy. And so when you got 40 women running after you, you can get knocked down. You can really hurt yourself. And, um, so we, we agreed to do that. And so I was working that. But then I met Krista Reza and Ra. Remember Krista and Ra from yes. uh, Shasta? Uh, mm -hmm. What a lovely couple. And, you know, Krista channels the Orion Council. And for what that's worth, because it's beyond the esoteric understanding values that I'm capable of. But I do enjoy tuning in every once in a while and listening to her because Krista is a very, very sensitive young lady. But so I'm getting to the point. So she and Ra had a table there at Contact in the Desert 2019, and they, he was selling his interesting little engineering device. It's a, a, a It causes a, a certain electromagnetic pulse, which actually does all sorts of benefits for machines in your car. And I dropped one of my gas tank, and I actually saw an improvement in gas mileage. Krista had some books out. One of them was on sacred geometry. And so this is coming, cycling back to sort of to you and Talos and languages. Um, I just opened up her book and looked at it. And right there on the page that I opened up was an exact duplicate drawing of one of the downloads that Weimer gave me on the way to Brooklyn while we were flying in that massive stellar craft. So they're communicating the same stuff to people all over. It isn't just me. I know there's other people that have met the same species I've met that are perhaps afraid to come out and talk about it, or perhaps they don't have the technology to do it like we do. But then I knew right away, okay, I drew this image in my personal notes on like the first week upon returning from the Torah system. And here's this girl who has written a book of sacred geometry, who has written not only that very intricate symbol because it's several loops and several lines and it's a physics symbol, She's done it so well. And then there was other things that I recognized. So they're communicating to her too. And well, they were in... about symbols. It's symbols. I it's want to really get back interesting. to the first night that we were at your place and you shared some of that, with the way that they described how codes are done. And when you suggested that in their minds, then it gets code. And, and when I shouted out, that sounds like a sigil to me. It, all of a sudden, that reason just popped into my head again. Thank you very much for that, by the way. But those were, when you started to show the flattened versions of those, that's when it triggered me to go home and look at some of that stuff again, because there were codes inside of what you were showing me that damn looked familiar to things that I had seen in the past. So here's some other dots that were connected. You were supposed to show me that to help me understand in the future we're not going to speak right. in this language. We're going right. to, it's, we're going to vibrate. We're going to see colors and sounds and vibration and symbols. It's, That's it's so beautiful. It has, that has such beautiful meaning, uh, Lowell, because you're right. It's almost like a gift from God. And he's telling all of those little children that we'll be happy and we'll be together because we, we, we've been getting these extra pieces of information to benefit Gaia and to, to benefit our brothers and sisters and to be there Quite for true. each other. Oh, yeah. No, I'm here for Gaia first. Uh, that's an explanation I'll give to some of the others. If they don't understand that, um, humanity will benefit. 
but no, my charge is here to help the earth. So I remember where I was going with all of that, because you'd asked me about contact with the Lemurians. And I had never really concentrated on it until recently. And here's what led up to that. When I had heard that what the Lemurians had to say about what my task was here, and that what my capabilities were, that they don't speak in languages that we understand. They speak in vibrations. And just like Sam, I have the ability to be able to interpret those things as well. So once I finally sucked that information in, then it occurred to me that, yes, I could. So I can get into a meditative state and I can have those conversations. So I've done it once since that happened. That was last weekend. It was quiet enough in the house. The kids were off camping somewhere. So I had an ideal conditions. Um, it's amazing what you can actually feel and then interpret once you give yourself the chance to do that. And honestly, I'd never consciously done it. So when people had asked me before, would well, you think you can do that? I went, yeah, I'm sure I can. I just never did. Now that I did, I understand what I get out of it. And so I'm right. going to explore that more. Wonderful. Um, I was thinking that it may be helpful because one of the things that you and I and uh, Rob Yox were talking about and some other people were talking about with me was the need, <clears throat> pardon me, I think some of us are realizing there's a great need to put some of this information or all of this information into an encyclopedia. And in a series of books that's accessible by everybody for free. And I think that one of the encyclopedias, volume L through N, uh, is going to have language. So L is going to be about language. And it's going to have to be probably a thousand pages to that one encyclopedia section. Because there's the Lemurian language. There's the mathematics language I received. Um, and there's a lot of different languages, uh, like Chris DeRaza speaks to the Orion Council. And there's a lot of, there's an interesting thing about that. And then there's the sacred geometry. And that's a language in itself. And there yes. are people that, that, that are mathematicians like myself that can look at geometry and understand why it's called sacred geometry. And then there's other people that are in sacred geometry that can actually look at it and translate it to you to explain describe what it is and so that's another huge difference within this type of language so then there's the light languages and there's all these other types of spoken frequential tonal languages that we need to start recording and i have a very strong feeling that these are the languages of the future and that in order for us to evolve a, a higher brain and to evolve a higher form of communication, we need to start learning these languages and actually speaking them to each other. The channel that Sam was in indicated that it was time for humanity to learn those things. Wow. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I have a, I was given a gift by Hung Zhao and Hung Chao, who were the, who was the Buddhist abbot at the city of 10,000 Buddhas in Talmadge, California. And it's the, it's the karmic cleansing wheel prayer from Dorje Sempa. And it's about 30 pages of Sanskrit liturgy. And so I've been studying it so that I can teach myself Sanskrit. And so I've, been, I've had this book for quite a while. And I'm actually getting very good at, at enunciating ancient Sanskrit. And then when I start, I'm, I'm recognizing things. So when I go on to, into books or see something, a photograph, that I can actually pinpoint things that are in Sanskrit on these 12,000 and 15,000 year old temples and actually read them. And so we need to start paying attention to ancient languages as well, because yes. there's a very power, strong connection between ancient languages and, and star languages. And somewhere in between, there's the human being. So we've lost to the mysticism and the greater intellectual glory from our ancient past, which did not revolve around toxins and plastics and money. It no. revolved around the spiritual awakening of humanity and building temples. And yeah. so if yeah. we can start looking at maybe taking your language and taking some of these other languages and transliterating them, translating them and speaking them, I think that there is some great value there. 
I agree. Well, my friend, I think I'm going to take a break. We're about 75 minutes in. Oh, so. listen, that's, that's great. I'm glad you told me because, you know, I could sit and talk to you for hours, dude. I love you so much. Exactly. And we will, but I'd rather break these up into more bite-sized pieces for people to digest. So this was a good place to begin. Now we can start to focus on those pieces of the puzzle because there's going to be triggers in all of this, something that you said that triggered something in somebody else. So we'll start to listen to the feedback. Then we can come back and start to build that foundation of information we had talked about before to help people really understand who they are. You're just this little capacitor here taking energy in and out. You're no all really people. different than the earth. Right. I just wanted to, to finish just with saying that all people, all people on the earth, all people in America, all of them, we're all special, sweet, dear souls. We, we all make mistakes all the time, but that's okay. We're learning and it's okay. And we love you. And we can all come together in love and forgiveness. And we can all be better people starting right now, or if you want, starting tomorrow morning. But let's let's all start. Let's all come together and, and be together and be here for each other in love. Let's love America. Let's love everything about ourselves. And let's start fixing the things that are wrong so that we can be here for our neighbors and be here for the children who are suffering. And then finally, we'll go to Washington and we'll help them too, because we know they're in big trouble. So I'd like everybody to say a prayer for our leaders and then say a prayer for the poor people that have to work 17 hours a day with under, under those leaders, because those are the real heroes. And so and then the last thing I'd like to say is I would like everybody to think of abundance for U.S. vets and for abundance for people that are working in the armed services. God bless those people. They, they are having such a hard time right now. And the whole, the whole idea about having a military is, is starting to become so antiquated that I think a lot of them realize that there's no need for armies anymore. Everybody's been beat up. It's time to stop beating up and killing and it's time to start healing. So let's think good thoughts about all of our, all of our folks in the armed services and make sure that we, we send them lots of love and compassion, okay? I appreciate that. Thanks for, that's a wonderful place to end. Um, I, I'm not going to add anything else to it because that's just a perfect place to end. So well, thanks I, again for your time, buddy. Thank you, Lowell. I love you very much. You're a very dear soul. And um, whatever ideas and whatever thoughts and feelings about helping humanity, I'm right behind you because you're a special human. Thank you for saying so. I know you are. So we'll follow up here soon with whatever the next topic is supposed to be. Pal. Well, thanks I'm working again. on it. I'm working <laughs> on it. All right. Hang on. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.